at least 8 million Americans suffer from anorexia or bulimia, diseases with the highest mortality rates of any mental Sleep illness. disorder is a psychological disorder, actually a mental There's illness. There's so much pressure to be skinny, it can lead to eating disorders like anorexia. People don't see the severity of eating disorders. These are disorders that know no age discrimination, mm -hmm. and we're talking all genders here. It's a horrible, exhausting disease. Nobody chooses it. It is the most intriguing illness on the planet. My name is Zaina Vaidas, and I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa at the age of 16. My name is Tegan Duncan, and I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa when I was 19. Living with anorexia affected every aspect of my life. It came to a point that I didn't know if I would wake up the next day. I mean, it felt cold. It felt like the world was inaccessible. Um, it felt frustrating to have such an illogical framework. I was constantly it felt like I was just hitting my head against the wall. It's an obsession. It's not something that we can control. It's not something that you want to know, oh, I want to look great, great for my bathing suit because when you see the pictures of me weighing 60 pounds, I'm not looking great in a bathing suit. Like all those years of illness were just kind of a blur to me because I was such a different person. I was having completely different thoughts and feelings. It was like I was driven by that voice and I didn't know what, what it was, but it was so compelling and so strong not for me to be able to ignore. It's kind of like it crushed every rational thought that I had in my head. I was the sickest physically I'd been and also mentally. I just, I just felt like I was tired of living. Um, I had definitely hit rock bottom and I drove myself to the emergency room and told the doctor what I was feeling um, and I just said like I'm just tired of living. So I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Andrew Staub from the Eating Disorders uh, Program here at Children Health Partners. Sometimes there's a misconception that eating disorders are just kind of like a fashion fa fad that of like our spoiled rich girls in Beverly Hills or something. But these are very serious uh, biologically based brain disorders uh, that have very high morbidity and mortality and they're not to be taken lightly. I think people's understanding of eating disorders is incredibly inaccurate. And the reason is for decades, it has been very misunderstood and misrepresented. Um, and the research actually hasn't been extremely strong. Um, and much of what people know about eating disorders actually comes like from the popular press um, or from just a complete misunderstanding of the causal factors. And most of the causal factors that have gotten press over time have been sort of sociocultural ones that suggest that somehow it's a choice to be at such a low body weight. And that is patently untrue. People don't choose to have these disorders. Uh, people with, with eating disorders are miserable often, they're suffering, uh, they have horrible body image, often have really low self-esteem, really struggle with high levels of anxiety and depression. And they're just constantly struggling with this, this inner critic that tells them how terrible they are and how they're fat and unlovable and disgusting and lazy and just their, their the mental suffering that goes along with eating disorders is, is horrendous, right, from what, in my experience. I, myself personally, have seen um, people, you know, young girls as young as eight years old with an eating disorder, and I've treated people all the way up to 80 years old. These, these disorders, these behaviors become quite instilled, right? So the longer that people kind of continue to engage in eating disorder behaviors, the more, the stronger it becomes kind of hardwired, and those neuron those neuronal connections in the brain get more, get strengthened uh, over time. So we have really shown um, without really any shadow of a doubt at this point that genes play a role in anorexia nervosa. Um, and in fact, we've gotten to the point where we identified eight loci or area on the genome that actually are implicated in anorexia nervosa. And we've taken that one step further and we've shown that there's also a lot of shared genetic material. So some of the same genes that influence other psychiatric disorders like depression and anxiety and schizophrenia also act in anorexia nervosa. There's a, a strong family history in people with anorexia nervosa, much higher rates of depression in the families, 
anxiety disorders, eating disorders in the family, and obsessive compulsive disorders much more strongly are related, and obsessive compulsive personality styles within the family. We collected blood samples for DNA from almost 17,000 people around the world with anorexia and 55,000 controls, so people without eating disorders. And we genotype them. And what that does is it sort of slathers a bunch of like a million markers across the genome, and then it compares the genome of people with the illness to people without the illness. Mm -hmm. And so that basically is sort of a way of sort of shining the light to mm -hmm. say, you know, look here, this is where the differences are. This is where some of the genes might be that influence risk for anorexia. Right, so there's a big difference between uh, people who are dieters and people who have anorexia nervosa, right? So uh, quite a high percentage of young women will actually engage in dieting behaviors, could be up to, you know, 50%, uh, whereas only about 0.5% of young women will actually have anorexia nervosa. Let's just say you have a class filled with 13 year olds um, and their teacher decides it would be a really good public health measure if everybody in the class goes on a diet. Um, crazy, you know, please don't ever do that, um, but it actually does happen, which is just amazing. Um, and if that whole class goes on the diet um, on Monday, by Friday, most of them are gonna say, forget this, I hate it, my body can't stand it, I'm going to go back to eating pizza and ice cream again because I like it and I don't like being deprived. And then there's going to be a subset of people for whom that diet might actually trigger binge eating um, because their body responds to that deprivation by then overshooting their satiety mechanism. Their body goes, sort of got, goes into hyperdrive and says, I need more food now. But then there's this small percentage of people, and those are the 1% who are at risk for developing anorexia, who find that when they go on that diet, it feels really good. And they, it might calm their anxiety. They might pre be pretty anxious at baseline, but they find that going on that diet actually makes them feel better. Um, and then that diet becomes the first step in sort of like the downward spiral to anorexia nervosa. I mean, in some ways, like the eating, symptom, the eating disorder symptoms are kind of a camouflage to deeper issues, right? So it's not just a simple thing about like eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, there are, there's a much more deeper, deep-rooted, deep-seated issues. But yeah, most of my thoughts were kind of exactly what you would expect about just my being garbage or my um, being insufficient or my being disgusting or how, how I was going to essentially repent for that and try to make up for how like weird and wrong I was uh, and in ways that didn't actually address anything. A lot of things in my life were spiraling out of control and I had a lot of need to avoid um, insecurities and failures that I had at the time. I needed a way to block out the world, actually. And having this kind of strict routine that was just causing more and more damage to my life and my health, um, that kind of control was the only thing that made me feel safe. You know, there are not just sort of teenage girls being spoiled and acting out. Often these people are really suffering and they're using the, the symptoms of the eating disorder to try to desperately try to feel better. The main thing they say about eating disorders is eating disorders are all about control. They're all about controlling your, um, your body and how you look and what you eat. And um, in a way that's, that's true, it might start out that way, or if anything, it would be like a false sense of control because at my lowest point, there was, I have never felt more out of control of my life. The anorexia was controlling me and all of my actions. And yeah, you feel really trapped. Tegan Duncan is, I think, you know, another player who is like heart and soul in the classroom. She leads the way. She's one of the best students at the university in general, uh, let alone student athletes. And I think she brings that level of detail to everything she does. But truthfully, like I've, I've never felt confident in myself as an athlete. So I think like part of the reason I I developed this illness in the first place was just from this feeling of never being good enough in my sport. So I developed my eating disorder in the summer going into my third year um, of university. And it's kind of crazy when I think looking back because it happened like so quickly. I went from 
a completely healthy, normal relationship with food. I didn't give it like a second thought what I was putting into my body to like full blown by the end of that summer, the, the five months, uh, like eating an apple would be terrifying. It is a very, it's very difficult to understand because on the outside, Tegan had everything, but she didn't feel that way, obviously. So it's just not something you can put a Band-Aid on. It was, went so much deeper. Tegan was uh, a high achiever in everything that she did. I think that she definitely had a level of perfectionism in how she approached training, uh, in particular, how she approached academics. Uh, where she was uh, an A-plus student pretty much every year. Um, I think attention to detail and, and very organized in type A, um, which is, I think, an attribute of a lot of student athletes at the university and elite level. Some of the same personality factors that can increase your risk for developing an eating disorder are also factors that can make you a great athlete. Um, you know, you're, you're ambitious, you can tolerate a lot of pain, you're dogged and determined. Um, you know, all of those things, if turned in the wrong direction, um, can feed right into anorexia nervosa. When I had two daughters, I was very concerned that we avoid weighing myself, talking about my own weight, weighing them, having scales around. Um, I didn't want them ever to get into sports that would make them feel they had to be skinny, like dancing or um, even gymnastics or things like that I worried about. So I was really glad when Taken took up hockey because I thought that would, we could escape that. You know, we see this in so many athletes. You know, they've got amazing, amazing abilities to work through pain. Well, guess what? Anorexia is pain, um, yeah. you know? So it gives you the ability to tolerate the illness. I mean, I knew I had lost a lot of weight in a really short period of time and I know I knew that I had developed some weird habits around food and eating, and it was definitely, it was taking up more space in my in my brain than it ever had before. Um, but hearing the, the doctor say, like, I, I think you have anorexia and you should go into treatment was, I didn't believe that. That took me like a couple months maybe to even come to terms with that and accept it. Like, I really, I really just thought they were overreacting on purpose. It was like a mom thing, like to, um, you're going down a dangerous path, like the, just stop yourself now, like this, before it gets out of control, but really, like I was already there and I was already in a full blown eating disorder and I couldn't see it. There are a lot of behaviors that I'm pretty embarrassed of looking back that I did uh, at the lowest point of my eating disorder. A lot, a lot of them were revolved around exercise. Um, weird, like, I think I, Typically like three, three workouts a day, I would go to the gym in the morning and then I'd have to go for a run later. I'd have to do another like hour at night in my room before bed. That became kind of, kind of a ritual in a weird way. Um, just like it became a really, really weird relationship between what, uh, evaluating what I had done that, that day and using it to consider what did I deserve to eat on that day. So that type of thinking, um, became really bad. About three quarters of patients with eating disorders have used um, exercise in kind of an unhealthy way. Often it can be kind of like one of the first symptoms to develop. And because it's so culturally um, sanctioned, right, it's very promoted in our society. And again, in the beginning stages, often people with eating disorders use exercise in a healthy way, that it can be, it's easy for those, that exercise symptom to kind of go undercover or kind of I go underground because it's, you know, people will say, you know, wow, you worked at the gym for so long, you went for a run and you played sports and you told me, you know, that's wonderful. You have so much self-control and uh, good for you. I think that was definitely, you know, a huge part of the, the over, overall problem was that um, it was just, you know, constantly um, feeling like she had to do something more um, or, you know, um, not wanting to be inactive. One of the other positive genetic correlations that we had was between anorexia nervosa and physical activity. So, you know, 
for years, people have been like, oh, that person's being really active because they don't want to get well and they're resisting treatment and, you know, all these pejorative ways of describing it. But now we know that some of the, some of the same genes that contribute to a drive to be physically active also contribute to anorexia nervosa. So there's a genetic connection between high physical activity and anorexia nervosa. Totally different way of looking at the symptom. Yeah, I remember being in a class actually at university and um, we learned about this study that uh, they actually showed that rats can themselves can develop anorexia. So they observed this for the first time in the 1960s, but the experiment has been repeatedly replicated since then. And basically what they do is they take a group of rats and they run them through an experimental phase where they feed them less food and they also give them access to a running wheel, mimicking the restrictive diet and hyperactivity seen in anorexia. Not surprisingly, all of the rats lose weight. But the interesting part in the experiment happens in the second phase when they give the food back. Some of the animals will quickly renourish and regain their weight while a group of them will not. They continue to run excessively and actually start eating less and less, avoiding the food even though it's sitting right there with some of the rats literally running themselves to death. So this has been critical in terms of proving the biological nature of the disorder, as it has showed that irrespective of human cultural factors, energy restriction and excessive exercise can be biologically addictive to some individuals who are predisposed to it. Activity-based anorexia model. Basically, we can, they will die. They will exercise themselves to death when their favorite food is sitting right next to them in a bowl. I remember sitting there in class thinking like, okay, so this can't all be my fault. Like this is, you're, they're observing this phenomenon in animals and in a situation where there's no culture, there's no drive for thinness, there's no body image is not, a concept. I, I have never caught a mouse or a rat looking in the mirror having a bad <laughs> body image day. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> it started out again with just wanting to eat healthy and I'm not going to have desserts or I'm not going to, but towards when I was in the worst points, it was not even there's no way that was a rational person doing those things. I used to like cut up my food into like as many different little pieces as possible. So I would only eat one and then like hide the rest. So like my, my dad didn't know, like I had a third of a slice of toast for breakfast and I left the other slice there. And like, so that, that became a thing in my head. Like you can never have the full serving size. Like you don't deserve to have the full slice of toast. Like why, and just um, became so compulsive. And it was just something I did. Like the, the thought process just becomes more and more automatic and ingrained. And I just ended up doing things that I'm, I'm really mortified of today. And as far as my family goes, I think that has probably been like, well, one of the, if not the most difficult thing about this experience is just they were supportive of me. They knew they knew I was sick and they knew I needed to get help and treatment and they were willing to, um, to provide that for me, like financially, whatever. They wanted me to get better more than anything. But at the same time, I, um, there was some, like there was anger towards me. And um, I remember in those times them just, just saying just fucking eat like why are you putting everyone everyone in the family stressed out your mom's not sleeping everyone's worried sick about you why are you so like self-absorbed that you just you just can't um just can't do it and you just can't gain the weight and i like um i think that like that disconnect between their understanding of illness and what i was feeling was really hard we did have some fights and there was really no anger and screaming, but I don't know if I would describe my approach as tough love. I think maybe her dad at times, um, but maybe Tegan perceived it that it was that. So it was definitely a lot of anger and yelling on my part at times. It's sometimes very easy for us as professionals, as family members to see, you know, all the hardship and pain that eating disorder is causing, uh, but we don't, you know, we're not going inside the person's head and seeing some of the benefits that they're experiencing from it, right? From our perspective, or from a parent's perspective, they see, we see the eating disorder as the problem. The sufferer, the person who has the eating disorder, often sees eating disorder as a solution to the problem. Yeah, I feel a lot of, a lot of guilt about 
what I've put my parents through and the worry and the concern. But when you're that deep in an eating disorder, you're not, you're not thinking about how you're affecting other people. You're that sick that you're just doing what you do to get through the day. My troubled relationship with food actually began uh, in the month of Ramadan, which is a month where pe people of my um, religion uh, fast for a whole month every day from sunrise to sunset. And I really think that was a trigger for me, for my eating disorder, for many, many reasons. One of them being that I sort of felt a rush um, going with, with long hours without food. So there's uh, sometimes a misconception that eating disorders only occur in, you know, young, uh, Western, wealthy, uh, white women. Um, eating disorders really don't care what sex you are. Um, they also don't care what race or what ethnicity you are. They strike across the board um, and they also strike across the world. Um, in the Middle East, mental illness is very little acknowledged, if even understood. Like back home in our culture, it's not something uh, you know, prevalent or it's not something that's talked about. Even me, like, I did not take it seriously. I just thought, you know, like, people that are going through anorexia are just models trying to lose weight, trying to look good. I always view the sociocultural piece as sort of the packaging that goes around the core biology. We package this strong drive for thinness um, and the low weight in this socio-cultural desire to reach some societal ideal. But in the 1500s, we saw the exact same thing biologically, but the cultural packaging was actually religious. So we saw saints like St. Catherine of Siena, who if you read her case report, it reads like classic anorexia nervosa, but her behaviors were all motivated by being closer to God and being more pure and being more saintly. So it's almost as if there's this core of biology that has persisted across time, but we just package it differently at different points in time throughout history. I think what got me latched on to the illness in the beginning was the feelings, the, the good feelings that I started having. I feel good not eating. And you know, this, this kind of euphoria, those, this kind of sense of feeling like, I don't know, you're high off of something. That was what, it, what I felt when I was empty of food for a very long time. We have heard this from so many different religions that have a fasting component to them. Um, and, you know, we've gotten exemptions for people, you know, basically, you know, going to whoever their religious leader is saying, fasting is dangerous for this person. You know, everybody else was grumpy. Um, you know, it's like, can't wait for the sun to go down, can't wait for the month to be over. Um, you know, but for someone who is prone to anorexia, it's great. Yeah, so the prayers were a lot harder for me to do with food in my stomach. And I remember feeling eager for the next day of fasting to start just because I was constantly craving that feeling that I had not eating, that euphoria, that contentment that I haven't felt in so long that I finally earned when I started fasting, which was crazy because it's sort of like a drug that I, that I was on throughout the day, like just feeling high and feeling so good, so content with the lightness and, and, and the emptiness that I was having from not eating at all. We've also shown that there's a genetic metabolic component to anorexia. People with anorexia seem to have a hypersensitivity to sensations in their gut. And whether they develop sort of like this heightened awareness and heightened sensitivity to sensations in their gut, including satiety, um, that might be one of the reasons why they stop eating earlier. We don't know, but it's one of our hypotheses that they just tend to be sort of hyper aware to sensations in their GI system. I was just busy chugging down liters and liters of water because I was scared of approaching food and of eating it and putting it in my body because that meant that I'd lose that sense of lightness, that sense of ease that I was feeling. Most people in the world find negative energy balance unpleasant. And what negative energy balance is, it's when you're expending more energy than you're consuming. Typically, and most of the world is growing in size, so most of the world is in positive energy balance. 
But people who are predisposed to anorexia nervosa often say that being in positive energy balance is really uncomfortable for them. They don't like feeling full. They don't like feeling as if they're consuming more energy than they're expending. They feel better um, when they are underweight, when they are not eating enough to compensate for how much energy they're expending. I got addicted to fasting for very long hours and the more addicted I became, the stronger a voice in my head started getting. I think as well, just the idea of control, the fact that I know that I now I'm controlling my body and now it's, you know, it felt good that I, I, I couldn't control anything in my life. No one knew what was wrong with me. I'd go from one doctor to another. They all thought there were, there was a medical or physical abnormality, but it, but there wasn't. I knew all along that I was an eating disorder, but I was running away from it because I didn't know how to find help surrounding that. And I was just so in shock after I knew that there was a whole treatment center for this illness here. My psychiatrist told me that she's here for me. She's going to give me a hand. She didn't scold me. She didn't tell me what I was doing to myself was unfair. She just told me that she's here to help me. And I think that was the first time in my life, or at least the first time in five or six years that I felt acknowledged. So there is a group of people who is really starting to make this more widely known um, and correct information more widely known throughout the Middle East. Because my understanding is it's much bigger of a problem than people realize it is. Um, and it's not talked about and it's not acknowledged um, and people can go without treatment and die. And then there's this perplexing part of anorexia where as much as we try to re-nourish people and get them to gain weight, um, they tend to engage in a lot of behaviors to try to keep their weight low because basically it feels better to them when their weight is low. The ones that tend to hit home are when you describe it in terms of phobias. Um, you know, so if someone's really afraid of spiders or really afraid of snakes or really afraid of heights, um, you know, I try to explain to people, well, someone with a fear of heights, you know, if I take you and put you on, you know, the tallest building in your city, um, and you have to stand on a glass floor and look down. Um, you'll feel your heart rate go up. You'll feel, you know, you'll be sweating. You'll feel just horrible. Um, that kind of horrible feeling is as intense as it is for someone with anorexia nervosa, for example, who is forced to eat a really high calorie, high fat food. Sufferers try to convince everyone it's not just about the weight. It's not like I, I'm that self-absorbed that I care about <laughs> this weight versus that weight, but it is about the weight at the same time because um, for me it's like the weight symbolized other parts of my identity and so I didn't want to gain weight it felt like I would because it felt like I was just giving up control um I, it's like I was giving up like just throwing in the towel and um like I, I had a fear that when I gained weight and got back to a healthy weight, I wasn't gonna have the same type of, type of drive and determination that I used to have. I think especially after people have it for a while, it sort of becomes part of their identity. Um, and it is also bound up with being um, perfectionistic um, about having accomplishments. Um, you know, a lot of those things become sort of rolled into a ball and the anorexia gets mixed up with these other personality factors that under other circumstances could be very positive. Weight gain sort of meant that I was gonna lose control, that I was gonna leave my addiction. Even worse, I didn't think I needed to because, you know, I I look at myself in the mirror and I think I look normal, even bigger than I would like. A lot of people, it's their understanding that people with anorexia are extremely vain. They only care about being skinny. The disconnect there is that, yes, it anorexia takes on a form of being involved with vanity. The body does have a large focus. That's on the forefront of the mind of sufferers of this disease. But it's less so in a, in a conscious, um, at least for me personally, like it's not even um, coming from a rational place. I'd say it for me, it feels kind of like an obsessive compulsive thing. Like it's just like an itch that that won't be like, like I can't scratch it no matter how many times it, it won't go away. It's always there. Like the focus on my stomach, the uncomfortable feeling of 
and it's like the urges to, to just grab it different places on my body and just especially like seeing the changes happen with recovery and watching my body change it's been like um extremely difficult getting past that i would describe my experiences with my body image now as just being uncomfortable in my own skin. You know, one of the mysteries of anorexia is why people have body image distortion. Um, we do not have an answer about what actually goes on in their brain that gets them to see themselves, either their whole body or parts of their body, as different sizes or shapes than it actually is. And the trick is for us to work together to help them develop a more accurate perception of themselves. Yeah, going into recovery and committing to recovery was was scary. I think common theme of, among patients with anorexia is that there's a part of you that wants to get better and wants to recover because you know your your life sucks <laughs> like this, but there's another part that just doesn't want to let go. You know, unlike some other illnesses where getting getting better automatically makes you feel better, but for anorexia the recovery process hurts. Renourishment can actually be uncomfortable. You know, if a person has to eat 4,000 calories a day in order to gain weight, that's a lot of food and it's hard to eat. And we hear a lot of patients who have just tons of gastrointestinal distress while they're being renourished. Now, that being said, eating is the way out. But at the same time, recovery is so much more than that. Um, I think the issue is you can't really do the work of recovery until you're eating yeah. um, because your brain isn't working your emotions aren't working your stomach isn't working um you know and you're just in horrible shape um mm -hmm. but it is only step one there's so much more to do taking away patients uh main methods of coping right we're taking if they're asked to stop you know restriction extreme dieting behaviors binging purging laxatives diet pills and excessive exercise they're to stop self-harming and substance abuse right, cold turkey across the board, uh, we need to fill that gap, that void with something else, right? So that's why we do a lot of work on, you know, dialectal behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy, looking at other coping skills that they can use to hopefully replace um, the maladaptive patterns of coping. My relationship with Zaina is really like the thing that helped me not only to stay in the program, but to really recover. I've never had a person up until that point that I felt comfortable talking about what I was going through openly and knowing that, that they would understand um, and that they would understand because they were going through the same thing as well. That was the silver lining of going into the hospital. That was the silver lining of my recovery. That is also the silver lining to this very day. A lot of times when we being, you know, all these, you know, 12 strangers together in a program, um, it's remarkable how they often feel like sisters, right? When, when someone is speaking in a group, they're like, wow, they're talking and it sounds like me talking. It can be quite um, a very supportive and a validating experience to come in. You know, fight to fighting it out in the trenches, uh, with their colleagues and their, their sisters in recovery, so to speak. I think of this experience as, with anorexia as being probably like the worst point of my life in a lot of ways and the most difficult, but honestly, like meeting Zaina, I, I remind myself of that. Sometimes there's a misconception in our society that, you know, it's all just about weight and once you get to your weight, then your quotation's cured. So the majority of people with anorexia will eventually make a full recovery. Um, it's not easy. It can often take uh, suffer sometimes many, many years to achieve that. It's just sort of like, now I'm back home. Now I'm no longer being watched. Now I'm no longer in a formal treatment. So I perhaps can go back a little bit to my old habits, to my old behaviors. And it wasn't something conscious at all. It's not like I was thinking to myself, oh, now I'm going to skip breakfast or now I'm going to do this and that, but it was just sort of like waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, I'm not hungry. Even though I did all that conscious effort to eat like I was eating in hospital, there was always this other part of me that's pulling me backwards and telling me to do all sorts of things that were against my own willpower, sort of. It was, it's just crazy. From my experience, I have relapsed a few times with um, anorexia, just periods where I got better briefly and thought, okay, I gained weight, this is fine, this is 
um, I'm normal now. People, you guys can all stop, like, get off my backs and stop worrying about me. But I think, like, after seeing myself fall so quickly back into old habits and just ending up in the exact same place time and time again, I think that's just um, proven to me that this is really something that is ingrained in your brain. And like these old habits really die hard and um, you know, it's not enough to, to just gain the weight and say, yeah, I'm better, I don't have a problem anymore. It's, it's very much like an addiction and like you're in recovery from addiction. This is something, I look fine now. Um, I look healthy physically, but this is always like a lingering thing in the back of my mind. Like the temptations are still there. Like what, one year, even after being in intensive treatment, I still have the urges to under eat and to over exercise. No, I don't think Tegan's recovered from anorexia and she may never, it may be a lifelong struggle for her enjoying food and not worrying about her weight and exercising. I don't think she's, I think she's on the road to recovery. But it's going to, I think even her social worker told us the average is five to eight years. And so we're just in the start and she's still in the beginning of, of, the, of the battle really. Uh, unfortunately, um, there is a subset of people who will not recover and will often develop quite a chronic um, uh, illness. And unfortunately, some of them will eventually lead to death, right? So uh, the mortality rates for anorexia nervosa, like I said before, are the highest rates of death for any mental illness, uh, which is quite disturbing. Um, it can be anywhere between 10 and 15% in the short term. For longer term cases, more chronic cases, you know, following up up to 20 to 25 years, the mortality rate can go as high as 18 to 20%, uh, which is very disturbing that one in five uh, women will actually succumb to the disorder and actually die from it. I think maybe people in the substance abuse world have done a better job of educating the public in terms of, you know, if someone's an alcoholic and they stop drinking for a month, they're not cured of alcoholism, right? So if someone is not engaging in these sort of behaviors, that doesn't mean that their brain and their psychology and their, you know, all these distortions and negative perceptions that they have, those don't miraculously go away. Every time somebody dies from anorexia nervosa, it's like another piece of my heart gets chipped away. Um, and so we are doing whatever we can to put an end to mortality from this horrible, life-interfering, life-impairing, life-robbing illness.